Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, do any, any Greek scholars in, in the room? Any Greek scholars? Anyone know the etymology of the word heresy, since we're in the Heretics Club? This hasn't come up in a Heretics Club before. I'm amazed, and I'm glad I'm not repeating anyone. <laughs> heresy comes from a Greek word, herein, a verb, which means simply to choose. So I'm very pleased that you have all chosen to be here today, and I'm, I'm grateful to Dean Cushing for choosing me uh, to come and speak with you. Uh, the theme, as I understand it, for the Heretics Club this semester is authenticity, and this is certainly an issue that I deal with quite a lot in my work as a curator at the Smithsonian. Uh, the, the issue of authenticity comes up with objects that you show in museums, obviously. The question, first of all, is is this object what people claim it is? Was it owned by those who claim it and used in the way that it has been claimed? But there's another way that authenticity is important when you think about, um, particularly about objects in American religious history. In, and I discovered that most recently in my uh, work curating an exhibit on religious diversity throughout American history. And you find very quickly that certain traditions have more objects available than others because throughout time they've had more resources, um, they've often had more wealth and been able to better preserve their material culture. So this issue of authenticity of objects is also related inevitably to authority, to power very often. And so the idea of authenticity is, uh, always has these tensions surrounding it. The question of who has the right to say something is authentic? Whose authenticity are we talking about? And different forms of authenticity are often um, in tension with each other. The authenticity of, uh, of religious traditions, let's say, or the authenticity of choosing to be a heretic, to go one's own way. In my own work, I've tried to explore that theme through individual stories, uh, beginning with my own family's story as um, I grew up in Massachusetts and I was the son of a Catholic priest and a Catholic nun. Um, Catholics in the room know that's not usually the way things work. <laughs> my mother was actually a former Catholic nun when she met my father, uh, who remained a Catholic priest. And so I grew up around um, this question of authenticity. Were we real Catholics? We certainly went to church quite often, and yet the family was built around this idea of transgressing certain rules of the Catholic Church. So these questions of, of authenticity have been very important to me, and I told that story in a book about my family called Vows, which came out about a dozen years ago. But today I wanted to focus my comments on a, another book that I wrote, a book that I published just recently, this, this past fall, a book called the Apparitionists. Uh, the subtitle is A Tale of Phantoms, Fraud, Photography, and the Man Who Captured Lincoln's Ghost. Uh, so I am drawn to stories in American history uh, that explore the, the tension around authenticity, you might say. And it will come out a bit, bit as I explain to you the story that's told in this book. Uh, before I begin to do so, though, I, I wanted to start with a question. Who has a camera with them today? Just something you can take pictures with. We nearly all do, right? And now, imagine if I had asked that question 20 years ago. You're in the same room, um, your students or your faculty, you're gathered together, someone asks you, who has a camera? Who thinks they would have said yes? Almost no one, right? During our lifetimes, we've seen a radical change in the way that we interact with images. There's not a moment we can't capture whenever the mood hits us, and whenever we take a picture, we don't just take one picture anymore, right? We take picture after picture after picture after picture. Uh, collectively, globally, all of this adds up, and current estimates are that uh, humanity takes one billion photographs every day. One of them will be perfect, I'm, I'm sure. Well, over time, we might find that because of this new capability, there has been a shift in our relationship with memory, maybe with loss, with what it means to have someone's face in your life on a daily basis, and then if you lose them, they only live on your phone. And maybe this is an, a shift in our, our relationship with experience itself. I see this in my own self, and I also see it especially in my children. I, I can remember on the 4th of July, the rest of the family was watching the fireworks, and my 12-year-old was watching her phone watch the fireworks. Uh, there seems to be, among the rising generation especially, a sense that only recording reality confirms its significance, maybe makes it authentic in a new way not possible until now. now. This change has been very abrupt. As we just saw, this has happened all within our lifetimes, 
and yet it's also part of a much longer history. It's the consequence, really, of a significant change in human perception that's not often recognized as such. And that would be the invention of photography in the 1830s. That moment when we could first freeze time and look back on those moments that have been captured radically altered how we see the world, how we see ourselves, and maybe even our understanding of what it might be possible to see. So that's the story that I try to tell through this book, The Apparitionist, and it's a story that unfolds um, 150 years ago in, in the 1860s. But it asks questions that I think are just as relevant now as they were then. Questions like, what is the relationship of seeing images to believing in them? What do we hope, fear, and believe technology might do to our lives? And once we know that images can be manipulated, can we ever really trust a single image again? Can we ever believe that an image is authentic? Well, when I began to think about how I wanted to explore those questions, it, it occurred to me at a certain point that the best way to tell it would be through a ghost story. Uh, and that's, that's what the apparitionist is. Though it's a story that unfolds in, throughout the 19th century, it actually begins with a selfie. This one. In the fall of 1862, an amateur photographer in Boston named William Mumler stood in a photography studio, and he took this photograph that would change his life. As he later described it, he had only really just begun to learn the photographic process, and so he was practicing by taking a self-portrait. He stood in front of his camera uh, for what was required then in exposure times for about 20 seconds, and then he walked back to the camera to see what he had created. It was only when he developed the image he made that things started to get a little weird. He discovered, as he would later tell any who asked him, that though he had been alone in his photography studio when he developed the photograph that he had made, the empty chair next to him was now filled with a girl who seemed to be made of light. You can see this blurry image there. He thought perhaps he had made a mistake. He was an amateur photographer. And at the time, ph photographs were made on glass plates initially. So it, uh, it was possible that he had not sufficiently washed a glass plate that had been used previously to make this image of, the gir of a girl. Uh, and yet, he, as he inspected it, he saw that he could see through her in ways and see the chair behind it, and that she was perfectly posed in the chair that suggested that this was not the case. It was not a mistake, but rather he had captured something unseeable by the naked eye. Well, William Mumler did not believe in ghosts, uh, but the woman who owned the photography studio where he was working, she did believe in ghosts. Her, she was a woman named Hannah Green Stewart. She's pictured here. Uh, she was a spiritualist, uh, someone who believed that the dead wanted to communicate with the living, and she was a faith healer. When she saw the image that William Mumler had made, she convinced him that he had captured the lingering spirit of a dead girl. And not only that, but uh, William Mumler, Mumler's own cousin, who had died 12 years previously. She persuaded him, and she seems to have been um, a very persuasive person. She persuaded them, him to reproduce the image, and together they sold it. A great profit of about $10, $10 per image. Uh, and the image brought them together. They soon married, and they continued to take these so-called spirit photographs, as they coined the term, first in Boston and then in New York throughout the 1860s. Crowds of educated, wealthy, otherwise entirely reasonable people sat before the Mumler's camera in hopes of seeing lost loved ones again. You would go to their photo studio, pose as you would if you were just having a portrait taken, and when you were given the image, um, you would see faint outlines. You can see the hands there, a faint face, the outline there, um, which, if you were inclined to believe it, uh, seem to resemble people you had lost in your life. During and after the Civil War, uh, the hunger for connection to the dead was so strong that even the fantastic claims of the Mumlers gave many people solace. By the time the Mumler saga ended a decade later, their spirit photographs had made headlines all around the world and their lives had intersected with some of the major cultural figures of the day. From the world of photography, 
Uh, the likes of Matthew Brady, who is the primary chronicler of the Civil War uh, during the 1860s, and Alexander Gardner, his, his chief rival. Photographers like this uh, began to suggest that somehow the art of photography itself was implicated in these images of death. Others involved in 19th century technology, such as, Sam, such as Samuel Morse, uh, inventor and popularizer of the telegraph, began to provide Am Americans with evidence of the invisible forces all around them. Uh, abolitionists like Freeborn Garretson, he's difficult to see here, but he has behind him uh, what seems to be the, uh, the spirit of an enslaved person with shackles here that have been broken. Uh, abolitionists look to spirit photography for evidence that people were treated equally in the world to come. And when William Mumler was eventually arrested for fraud in 1869 uh, and, and brought to trial in New York City, um, P.T. Barnum uh, showed up to testify against him. Uh, Barnum loved a good scam, of course, but he much preferred those he could control and profit from. Most infamously in the career of William Mumler, the promise of his rumored abilities brought Mary Todd Lincoln to his studio twice, uh, first after the Lincoln's son Willie died while the Lincolns were still in the White House. And then years later, after Abraham Lincoln had died himself, she returned to his studio. And you can see here Abraham Lincoln's hands, the faint outline of his face. Uh, so this image became William Mumler's most famous image. It is the last living image of Mary Todd Lincoln, um, the last dead image of, of Abraham Lincoln. And Mary Todd Lincoln believed in this image in such a way that she would never be persuaded it, it was not authentic. Well, the press uh, covering William Mumler's trial was extensive in 1869, which from a writer's point of view is, is just a godsend. This made, <laughs> makes it possible to, to tell a complete narrative uh, story rich in detail and to really tell it as you might tell a novel, uh, to recreate the story uh, down to the dialogue and the descriptions of people uh, who, who were involved. And this is what the press said. Well, here's, here's one clip, I believe. Um, to the spirit photographs, some remarkable testimony in favor of the genuineness of the photographs. This is what the press said in New York City at the time. The intensity of the interest manifested by the public in this case has never been surpassed by any criminal investigation in this city. There are thousands who believe. And that's what's most interesting to me about this story of William Mumler and his spirit photographs. He can be seen in one way just as a petty con man, uh, someone who is out to take advantage of people who've experienced loss, and he's trying to exploit them. But what about those thousands of people who believed in him? It would be easy for us, let's see, do we? It would be easy for us to think that, to think of them as somehow being less sophisticated than we are, <coughs> that they were simply naive to fall for all of Mumler's tricks. But that doesn't really take into account how belief works and the ways in which belief is always entwined with the cultural forces all around it. To understand why so many people believed in these outrageous spirit photographs, we really need to consider two histories that ran parallel to each other in the middle of the 19th century. And that's the de development of spiritualism as a religious idea and the development of photography, which seems disconnected, but is, as, we'll, as I'll talk about, uh, are fully entwined at this time. Well, though it's often remembered as a pursuit of a seance holding hucksters, spiritualism in the middle of the 19th century was actually one of the most popular religious movements of the day. There were millions of Americans who believed actively that they could communicate with the spirits of the dead. The origin story of spiritualism, at least as far as its creation myth, the story that's told about how it began, actually unfolds not too far from here, about 100 miles away outside of Rochester. It begins with these three sisters. Leah, Leah, Kate, and Margaret Fox, uh, who lived in the village of Hydesville outside of Rochester. Um, as I'm in the, the city of Hamilton, I need to ask, are there any fans of the Hamilton musical here? Well, then, then you will understand when I say that the, when my book, The Apparitionist, is turned into a Broadway musical, the Fox <laughs> sisters will be my Schuyler sisters. And I say that not knowing if they could sing, uh, but I know that they could snap, they could tap, and they could rap. What they became known for in this, in this village of Hydesville outside of Rochester was hearing and creating sounds in the walls of their house, which they claimed were spirits communicating with them. Living out in a farmhouse far, far from 
from cities and other um, means of amusement, they were apparently bored one day and convinced their parents that they could hear taps and knocks in the walls, and that further, these taps and knocks were the spirit of a dead man, a man who had been murdered in their house. They began to uh, make these sounds and describe what they were hearing. Their parents told their neighbors. Their neighbors came to listen. Tens of people came. Hundreds of people came. Soon thousands of people came. And then the Fox sisters took it on the road. They visited cities up and down the East Coast. And people were so uh, moved by this and so persuaded by what they were performing that there soon were copycats. And others were developing their own ways of communicating with the dead performing it in theaters and often charging a fee. Well, one of the reasons that spiritualism spread so quickly at this time is, is, seems kind of surprising. While today we tend to think of technology as the enemy of superstition, the seemingly magical innovations of the middle of the 19th century actually helped to spread spiritualism. When you think about electricity, suddenly you're aware of this energy all around you. And particularly the telegraph. Spiritualists like the idea of the telegraph, the possibility of communicating across hundreds of miles so much that they named their first newspaper after it, the spiritual telegraph. As far as they were concerned, if you could communicate from, let's say, Baltimore to Washington, D.C., as the first um, most famous telegraph message did, they thought that if only you had more power, if only you had more electricity, you could perhaps send a message across that greatest distance of all from the world of the living to the world of the dead. So the Fox sisters themselves compared their work to Samuel Morse, and they even said that God's telegraph, which they thought was what they were performing, um, they said that this predated the actual telegraph. Another person really taken by this idea was, was this man, uh, Andrew Jackson Davis. Uh, he was known as the seer of Poughkeepsie. I'm not sure why Poughkeepsie got its own seer, uh, but he, he made uh, quite a name for himself as the seer of Poughkeepsie. Andrew Jackson Davis was something like the St. Paul of spiritualism to the original evangelists of the Fox sisters, whereas they had the uh, primary experience. He provided an intellectual framework for it, um, was able to explain it far better than they ever could. And he also loved this idea of the telegraph as a metaphor for the type of communication they were performing. In anticipation of the transatlantic telegraph, so before they laid the cable across the bottom of the ocean, Andrew Jackson Davis suggested that spiritualism would be the best way to send messages from one side of the Atlantic to the other. He said it would look something like this. So, um, so this is, this is the ocean, this is the expanse uh, from one continent to the other. Andrew Jackson Davis suggested that if the living in New York wanted to send a message to the living in London, the, they should communicate with dead New Yorkers who would pass the message on to, to the dead in London who would then convey the message. And when you look at this, uh, it's easy to think, well, this is just crazy, <laughs> right? But when you think that the alternative is going to be laying 3,000 mile, uh, miles of cable at the bottom of the ocean, and that's how we're going to send messages, this starts to seem maybe a bit more reasonable. Maybe. Well, at the time, so much seems suddenly possible that it was hard to separate innovation and invention from pure fantasy. And that's why we should consider not only the rise of spiritualism when we think of William Mumler and his ghost photographs, but the te technology on which he depended. And we need to ask what it was about, about photography itself that inspired people to believe in William Mumler's images. You might say that from the beginning there was something spooky about taking pictures. It's easy now to forget the miracle it must have seemed when people saw the first photographs, this ability to stop time, to capture moments, to own them in that way that, ver that verb capture suggests. And that uncanny ability had unexpected effects on how we see and remember. This picture here is one of the earliest photographic experiments made by the man credited, credited as the inventor of photography, uh, Jacques-Louis Daguerre. Uh, it's thought to be the first photo of human activity. It's hard to see, but right down here, um, there are two figures. One is thought to be a boot black, so a shoe shiner, and his client. 
man standing very still with his foot up on a box to ha having his sh shoes shined. This photo was taken at 8 a.m. on a, um, a weekday morning in Paris. And you see it and you think, wow, they all sleep in pretty late in Paris. I mean, it's, um, there's, the road is absolutely empty and this was a busy boulevard in a major city. But in fact, when this photograph was taken, the street was as crowded with people and commerce as you would expect of a major city at eight in the morning. Horses and carts and pedestrians all coming up and down the boulevard. And yet at the time, the exposure necessary, the exposure time necessary for capturing an image was so long, more than a minute, that only those figures standing absolutely still would be preserved by the photograph. Right? So that is the trade-off of photography, this ability to, to, uh, to capture a moment, to freeze a moment, re required parts of it to be immobile, to, be, to lose some of their vit vitality. So you look at an image like this compared to the images that Mumler was creating, and you ask again, is this authentic? Is it an authentic capturing of that moment in time? Even though there was no intention to deceive, is this image, in a way, a deception? So perhaps inevitably, given that photography required this, uh, this immobility, uh, it required a certain type of stillness, inevitably, his the history of photography began to uh, develop in a way that privileged capturing images of death, of immobile bodies and lives. Before photography, faces began to be forgotten when you lost a loved one the moment you closed the coffin lid. Only those who had the means of hiring a portrait painter, let's say. So a very wealthy person could hire someone to, to paint a likeness of their grandfather. And so when he died, you could look back and remember, this is what he looked like. For everyone else, you relied only on memory. And memory, of course, begins to fade almost immediately. When, uh, when Jacques Daguerre was beginning to think about the uses of photography, he made a point of saying that he did not think it would be useful for portraiture, for taking pictures of human faces. His reason was that there are far too many movements in a human face. We all have to blink, we twitch, and we simply could not stay still enough that we would be captured the way the boot black and his client were. But as it happened, there were some human faces that could remain perfectly still. Postmortem photography becomes an, an important part in, in the development of photography in the middle of the 19th century, precisely because it allows families with a way of capturing the images of their loved ones before they're put in their grave and their faces begin to fade from memory. And because of this, photography developed this enduring connection with death. And this took on a particular meaning with the coming of the Civil War, that a period in American history when three quarters of a million Americans are killed and the nation is grieving as a whole as never before. At the very moment that William Mumler is taking his first ghost photographs in Boston, the photographers of the Civil War, particularly Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner, they're off on the battlefields of the South, capturing the images of the war for the very first time and capturing particularly images of the war dead. And for this, they're remembered as the progenitors of photojournalism. Uh, but unfortunately, the way they, they did this, they also became the originators of what today we might call fake news. Many of these photographers have been trained as painters. And so when they went out on a battlefield to capture images of the fighting and the carnage, they were often as concerned with getting a well-composed image as they were with chronicling history. You can see this in some of their early images. Um, these are, this is a photograph taken by Alexander Garter at the bat Battle of Antietam. Um, you can see it's very, it, it's very well composed, it's very painterly almost in how he puts his images together. Uh, because of the required time of setting up the camera and the exposure times that I've mentioned, you were not out just taking snapshots and moving along. You would take a half hour to compose an image and get it perfectly right. So these men who were trained as painters could not help but try to make a work of art as gruesome as they seemed at the time. These images, as they began to reach the public, turned out to be what people most wanted to see about the war. 
they were authentic. They were the real views of what was happening at the, uh, in the war as far as the American public was concerned. Matthew Brady, a, a month after the fighting at Antietam, so just a month after an image like this was taken, he mounted a, an exhibit of these images at his gallery on Broadway in New York City, uh, which resulted in a remarkable review in the New York Times. It's difficult to read where you're, so I'll just read this to you. The living that throng Broadway care little, perhaps, for the dead at Antietam. But we fancy they would jostle less carelessly down their great thoroughfare, saunter less at their ease, were a few dripping bodies fresh from the field laid along the pavement. There would be a gathering up of skirts and a careful picking of the way. Conversation would be less lively and the general air of pedestrians more subdued. As it is, the dead of the battlefield come up to us very rarely, even in dreams. Suddenly, photography filled the dreams of the living with visions of the dead. The possibility of seeing sites previously hidden changed public perception of the war, and it created competition for more and more of these images. Photographers who were, who were rivals like Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner began to go out in the battlefields with the intent of capturing images of the dead, and they would go to extreme measures to do so. Alexander Gardner uh, would travel, would walk the battlefields carrying props. He carried a prop rifle and a cap so that if he found a, a dead soldier in the field, he could arrange those props so that it looks like he had captured the body the moment after it fell. He even went so far, and this is a very infamous example of this, of finding a body in the field, the body of a dead con Confederate soldier, looking up this somewhat ragged field which somewhat <coughs> obscures the body, and seeing this very photogenic tableau of these rocks that looks something like a cradle or a bed, something where he could frame the body and make a much more artfully composed picture. Alexander Gardner and his assistants dragged the body of this Confederate soldier 40 yards up the hill and posed him here so that he could uh, pose him in a way that he knew would create a more compelling and captivating image. And not only did he do that, but when he published this, these images, a collection of them as Alexander Gardner's sketchbook of the war, he wrote uh, elaborate and fully fictional captions telling the story of the last moments of this man whose last moments he was, he was nowhere near. Uh, Alexander Gardner's chief rival at the time is Matthew Brady, and seeing the success Gardner was having with this, uh, Brady also went to, this is at Gettysburg, Brady arrived at Gettysburg two days after the fighting. All the bodies had been moved. Matthew Brady had his assistant lie down in a field where fighting had taken place and play dead. In his caption for this image, which he sold, it said, Dead Confederate Soldier at Gettysburg. Months after the fighting, local, local photographers in Gettysburg wanted to get in on this action. So a photographer named Peter Weaver, working out of Gettysburg, gathered up living Union soldiers and asked them to lie down on this same set of rocks where Alexander Gardner had taken his picture of the dead Confederate soldier. He took this picture, again labeled it the dead at, at Gettysburg, but after this picture was taken, all of these soldiers got up, dusted themselves off, and went off to fight another day. Well, it may be going too far to compare moving bodies with claiming to move souls, but all of this helps explain why William Mumler's arrest for fraud in the spring of 1869 captured the imagination of the nation and filled headlines for months. Here's some of the press coverage. A stupendous fraud, this is from the New York Times. Some more various news clippings. Uh, this is a short account of, of a single day of the, uh, of the trial in which it's explained that, um, that one of Mumler's defense attorney's big, uh, big moves was that they wanted to show that spiritualism, the, the ability to communicate with the, the dead, is shown throughout the Bible. So Mumler's defense attorney picks up a copy of the Bible and reads extensively from the first, uh, from first book of Samuel as part of Mumler's defense. So all of this was a novelty at the time. It became a real circus, both at, at the tombs, which is the name of the, um, the police court in New York City, and in the press. It was something, perhaps, to lighten the mood at the end of a very dark decade. And 
it also seems that something deeper was clearly at stake in all this. In the trial of William Mumler, it wasn't just one con man on trial, but belief in the ability to talk with the dead was on trial. And more than that, it was the authenticity of this new technology and the hope that people put in technology at the time. Would it allow us to see things that we had not been able to see before? These were all put to question during the trial. This was a time when questions of belief were inseparable from the new technologies that were then remaking the nation. The telegraph, electricity, photography, all of it was new, all of it was baffling, all of it seemed utterly fantastic until suddenly it was everywhere, making it difficult for many to separate genuine marvels from showmanship and sham. Even those creating these images often did not fully appreciate the difference at the time. For all these early image makers and those who looked on their pictures, the ability to make and see images as never before was deeply unsettling. It was a challenge to perception like no one had ever experienced before. If this starts to sound a bit familiar with some of the things that we are facing, that's really why I told this story now and why it seemed important to tell it now. We have the power to make and share images as never before in human history. And related to that, we should begin to ask ourselves to what extent we're also held in the power of those images. These people, they all believed in William Mumler. We should ask, what might the images that we see cause us to believe? As it was 150 years ago, today we're all implicated in the creation and manipulation of pictures and personas. And no less than William Mumler, we're surrounded by invisible forces. In our social media feeds, for example, it's impossible to know if the entities we encounter are flesh and blood on the other side of some other screen. On Twitter, these might be uh, ghosts cooked up in some Russian crypt. Uh, Facebook currently has a dead population of about 50 million and growing every day. If you look at these sites and you see how people interact with the profile pages of people who have died, if you do not know that one side of that conversation is deceased, it seems like an active conversation. You can see people speaking to the dead on Facebook saying, remember the time we went to the carousel? I'm still thinking of you. You hear people, you read people speaking and writing in present tense to the dead in a way that would have seemed familiar to many of those people who were practicing spiritualism at the time of William Mumler. We're all constantly drawing and redrawing lines between what we know is real and what we suspect might be something else. The question that binds us to all these people who believed in William Mumler is how will we be able to know when we can no longer tell the difference? Thank you.